Labyrinths is brought to you by Knox Robinson Productions. Please consider becoming a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you can listen to Labyrinths ad-free. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson to learn more. We were able to get Daniel Villegas a not guilty verdict in El Paso in a trial, which was amazing yeah. you know, to sit in that courtroom and to see the way a, a judge will handle the uh, way defense and, and state put a case on and contrast Judge Madrano with Judge Burnett, the judge I had in my case. I had an alarming moment one time during deliberations. At one point, I'm standing by the exit door and I noticed the bailiff come out of the uh, courtroom and he's walking straight towards me with purpose. But I'm thinking he's headed towards the exit door behind me. So I kind of stepped to the side out of his way and he changes directions coming still straight towards me. And instantly my fight or flight instincts kicked in and I wanted to turn and run. I was like, oh, it's coming for me. What is going to happen? But I stilled myself and stayed there and he walked right up to me and said, Mr. Ballin. I said, yes, sir. He says, uh, the judge would like to see you in his chambers. Follow me. And he about faced him. I followed him. And when I walked into the judge's chambers, there was Judge Madrano. He had removed his robes because it's deliberations and everything. And he just grabbed my hand. He said, on behalf of the justice system here in Texas, I just want to say I'm glad that you're a free person now. And I just want to say that what happened to you, I want to make sure never happens to someone in my court. Right? Feeling lost? Then you're in the right place. I'm Amanda Knox. And I'm Christopher Robinson. And this is Labyrinths. Last episode, we spoke with Anna Vazquez of the San Antonio Four about her harrowing wrongful conviction. She and three other women were accused of child molestation during the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s, a social hysteria that swept up hundreds of innocent people and often people who stood out as different. Anna and her friends were lesbians in Texas. Jason Baldwin, who you just heard, also stood out as different in his small town of West Memphis, Arkansas. He and his friend Damian Eccles listened to Metallica, and they wore black. And Damian was interested in Wicca and pagan religion. That was enough to bring the lens of suspicion on them when the dead bodies of three missing eight-year-old boys turned up in a ditch in May of 1993. And when their friend Jesse Miss Kelly was coerced into confessing, the fate of these three teen boys was sealed. Despite a lack of physical evidence linking them to the crime, the West Memphis Three, as they became known, were all convicted of murdering the three boys in what prosecutors argued was a satanic ritual. Jason, who was 16 at his arrest, was sentenced to life, along with Jesse. Their friend Damien got the death penalty. Today, we're speaking with Jason Baldwin. Speaking about what I've gone through and my experience, that's part of my healing process. And I welcome it, you know, especially if I believe that the audience is receptive and that I believe that, you know, someone out there is going to learn a lesson from it and Maybe it's a future law person that's writing laws, a lawyer, whether they're for the state or defense, and it may enable them to look at what they're doing in their work a little bit differently to help prevent something similar mm -hmm. from happening to someone else. I don't hide from my experiences. I draw upon them as a strength. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I do talk about it a lot, uh, usually when I'm invited to do talks and interviews and things, you know, those are the topics of discussion. But, you know, like anyone, you know, when, when you're asked to talk about your life, you're asked to talk about your life's experiences. And these, as you and I both share, are, you know, are similar life's experiences. So that's what we draw upon. We can't just like close off that section of our life because that's closing off a part of ourselves and, and the wisdom and lessons we've learned during those times. In that situation, when you're victimized, you can carry yourself with grace or you can become something worse than what they make you out to be due to anguish and grief and not being able to heal and deal with it in a healthy manner. Jason has had a lot of time to reflect on his experience and gain insights from it. But to tell Jason's story properly, we have to explain what it was like growing up in West Memphis, Arkansas in the 80s and 90s. I actually moved to Arkansas on the last day of school for fifth grade. I was living in Memphis, Tennessee, and I came home from school thinking, uh, Kind of had the whole summer with my friends to swim and play in the trails and ride bikes, 
got off the bus and there's a U-Haul truck there. My grandparents are there and we're moving to Arkansas while my stepdad's at work. So he's coming home to an empty house. Me and my brother's like, whoa, we didn't know we were moving. My mom's like, if I'd have told y'all, y'all would have told him and he wouldn't have allowed it to happen. So that was astute on her part. But it didn't afford my brothers and I an opportunity to say goodbye to our friends, you know, in the neighborhood and at school, because we all just thought we would be playing with them all summer. But we're kids. We were resilient, and we moved to Arkansas, Lake Shore Trailer Park. Um, my grandmother uh, gave us one of her rent trailers to live in rent-free, which was very nice. I had an obligation to uh, be the crowns keeper for her other rent trailers, so I pushed the lawnmower and mowed floor ass. But we, you know, my brothers and I, we made friends fast with the kids in the trailer park. My mom was like, hey, y'all want to uh, go swimming at the VFW Swimming Pool? And it's in West Memphis. And because everybody, uh, Mel and my family pretty much served our country, you know, in foreign wars, we had a membership to, you know, VFW, Veterans of Foreign Wars. And so we could go to and swim in the swimming pool free as part of our membership as our family. And we could also bring guests. You know, there were these kids just down the street from us. And so my mom loaded us all in the car and she took us to the uh, swimming pool. But we could not get in. The, the people were so hateful. They were throwing pickles at us. They were calling us racial slurs, calling our friends ends, calling us in lovers. And we couldn't get in the pool. Wow. My mom took us home. And... and when we got home, my grandmother comes skidding up in the yard. They had called her and recognized her car. And she berated my mom in front of all of us. She goes, I didn't give you that car to show her a bunch of hands around. And she used the full racial slur. And so it was then that I learned about racism. I learned that West Memphis is a racist town, that my grandmother was infected by racism. I've often wondered, you know, if if, you know, someone there in that swimming pool, some kid didn't go home to a parent who was a police officer or something, and they didn't ask him, well, how's your dad at the pool? And, and if they didn't say, hey, you wouldn't believe what happened. This dude tried to bring a bunch of ends to the pool, right? Well, we showed him. We ran them all. Instead of going to the swimming pool, Jason and his brothers found places to play closer to home. Out in the middle of the soybean field, which our trailer park was in, there were these old sheds. They, they were abandoned. They didn't have any signs on them that said no trespassing or anything like that. And all of the kids had played there for generations, for years. And I don't know how long it takes a tree for a tree to grow, what their lifespan is. I don't really know what kind of tree this was. <laughs> but it had evidently began its life outside the building. But during its growth, it, it eventually hit the side of the building and pushed its way into the building and lifted the roof off of the building. <laughs> uh, and I say building, it was a tin shed, you know, yeah. tin roof, tin shed, and it didn't have a floor. It was a dirt floor. But they showed us as you climb up the tree on one side and then you're outside and then you climb down the tree on the inside, right? <laughs> and then in their greeting, you would be sunflowers looking up because they were getting the sun from the roof lifted up. And to us, it was like, you know, Lord of the Rings, a tree you know, they, they were holding the roof up, inviting us in. And then inside were these old shells of cars, tore up car frames and stuff. And to us, in our imagination, they became uh, Millennium Falcons, X-Wing <laughs> TIE Fighters and things like that. And so we, we played there every day that summer, yeah. every day. We'd swim in the lake, play hide and go seek in the soybean fields, play Star Wars in the shed, you know. And then one day something happened that had never happened before. And the front doors came screeching open, almost like Darth Vader was there. And it was the police, and, and they rounded up like a dozen of us, just kids ranging ages from 8 to maybe 12. I was 11. My brother Matthew was 9. And took us to the police department and says, hey, we're, we need your phone number. We're going to call your parents to come get you. Y'all shouldn't be playing out there. Don't worry. You're not in any trouble. We just want to know. Who told you about this place? When did you first start playing? Do you have any brothers or sisters that played there that weren't here today? Any cousins, any other friends? And so before the end of it, they had ended up arresting every single kid in the trailer park and, and taking us all to the police station. And eventually, some kids, they pressured in the sand. 
that they had broken things in there when really none of us broke anything in there. If anything had broken anything in there, it was due to negligence and time and the elements, you yeah. know, and not us. To us, it was our, our place, you know, our clubhouse or, you know, it was sacred to us, kids, you know, where we went to have fun, you know, until the police were there. And so we ended up getting a, a public defender and a, Mr. Montgomery was ours, you know, my brothers and mine and my mom would take us there and he would tell us, he's like, I can't believe that they're charging you with a crime for this. I'm going to talk to the prosecuting attorney and get charges dropped. You just stay out of there, you know, no trespassing. And we'll make sure the owners put up sign, no trespassing sign. And, and it seemed fair and reasonable. And that's what we thought was going to happen. And so all of us ended up going to court. Prosecutor Fogelman, he gets up and he says, your honor, I think two years in the state reform school would do all these kids some good. And Mr. Montgomery stood up and followed that with, Your Honor, I agree. Wow. And before the judge could say anything, my mom jumped up and said, Your Honor, my sons aren't going to kids' prison. And the judge said, Ma'am, counsel, come to the bench. And they went up there for what I know now is an in ex parte meeting. And when my mom came back, she had that look that mothers get that you can't argue with that means she's putting her foot down and when she got to where i was seated she put down some paperwork she said you will sign this. you will not argue with me and i ended up signing like everybody else did for five years probation and a $500 fine wow that was $500 for me $500 for my brother and then some kids' families had five or six kids in their families, you know, tragically struck by that. And so for us, you know, our family budget, we only had a $100 budget for all three of us kids for Christmas. You know, so and, and for us, that's 10 Christmases gone right? for my family. If you had my $500, my little brother Matt's $500. And so from that point on, all of us were felons. All of us were, were troublemakers. All of us were trouble. And so when I started school the next year, we'd just be sitting in class and all of a sudden the intercom would come on and they would say, send Jason to the uh, principal's office. So I'd have to go to the principal's office and there would be my uh, probation officer and I'd have to, you know, answer questions, you know, how are you doing in school? How's your homework? I mean, all these things. And so he was very cordial, very professional and never abused me. But because of this continued action and practice, people outside of the trailer park, because the schools didn't just comprise the trailer park. The trailer park was a very small fraction of the uh, population that went to the school. We, we were actually the poorest fraction. Everybody else lived in the houses and, you know, we're, we're nicely dressed and stuff. And so this burden was even harder and made life even more difficult for us because now instead of talking to us directly, people are just saying behind our backs, why do those kids always get call to the principal's office oh you didn't know they're all trouble they all are hmm. on probation or parole and have a probation officer and so that gave our trailer park this horrible reputation and, and then it, it it made it to where we were ostracized even worse than normal wow and so we weren't even allowed to associate or be friends with anybody at that point anybody outside my trailer park it was very difficult to be friends with people inside the trailer park. You can't be friends with them if they have a record. Friendship was very difficult, you know, in, in those years, being able to have a friend legally and being able to have a friend that's worth had. But despite the prejudices of his community, Jason was still able to form a few friendships with other boys his age. I was biking home from the store and uh, on the next street over, there was this kid I'd never seen before on a skateboard. And uh, we struck up a conversation and he let me ride a skateboard. I let him ride my bike and we became friends. And he was like, I saw you in study hall. And I'm blind. At the time I didn't have glasses. I can't see that few feet in front of my face. I was like, oh, well, I didn't see you. <laughs> but here we are now, dude. <laughs> hey. That kid was Damien Eccles. From when I met Damien there, we became friends. Uh, I actually met Jesse on my first day of school in Marion in the sixth grade and uh and my homeroom class uh did really good, met kids in there, did all right, you know, making friends and stuff. And uh but at recess there at the end of the day it was the whole school instead of just my class. And I'm out there talking to people, still doing okay, cool and everything. And uh next thing I know I notice out the corner of my eye, like blurry shape, not that vehicle, 
moving really fast towards me, right? And out of nowhere, a fist, right, tries to punch me in the face. And so I just duck and move. And then he turns and comes back at me again. So I just take off running. This dude is chasing me all around the playground. He's like a couple of years older, you know? And uh, I hear this voice saying, Jesse, Jesse, stop. Jesse, get over here. Jesse, promise me you won't try to hit him again. Jesse, give me your word. I said, promise. And he says, I promise I won't try to hit him again. And that's when I met Jesse. You know? <laughs> I was a new kid and he tried to beat me up. And, what? and this girl, t- this girl, Don uh, Spurlock, got him to give his word that he wouldn't try to hit me again. You know? That's so weird. Okay, so that's how you met Jesse. Meanwhile, when you met yeah. Damien, he's like, here's my skateboard. How, like, let's yeah. hang out. <laughs> right, so there's your different compare and contrast. And I would get to uh, know Jesse better. Uh, he would, uh, later on, a couple of years later, maybe in the eighth or ninth grade, he would move on the same street I lived on for like part of a summer he lived there. You know, and so I'm like, oh, okay, hey. Don't try to hit me. But I didn't say that. No. But I'm kind of looking at him like, oh, it's right here on my street. You got to try to bully me. I mean, does the promise still stand? You know, and not that we've been around each other. Or nothing. But, you know, he was cool and a good neighbor and stuff. We got to know each other. Got to know his dad really well. But then he moved back to Highland Trailer Park. When you're a kid at that age and, and then you're uh, bound by, you know, probation and you can't really go far, you know, from your home. You have to you know, stay close. And so... For Damien, he would move to Lakeshore Trailer Park, but he didn't have a record. You know, he he wasn't one of the kids that was a few years earlier got swept up for playing hide and go seek out in the shed or whatever. But he still suffered the prejudice. And so he would end up falling in love with this girl, Deanna, who lived in uh, Marion. And uh, her father, once he learned that Damien lived in Lakeshore, he was like, oh, that's where all those bad kids live that have a record. My daughter not going to date one of those guys and so he forbade them to see each other he forbade her to see him the way he reacted to deanna wanting to date damien who was from that trailer park so obviously the prejudices had reached him if damien would have lived next door to him or on the same street of him and lived in a nice house and had a nice family he wouldn't have acted that way if the, the word hadn't reached his ears that all the kids from that trailer park had a record, he wouldn't have acted that way. He would have said, oh, that's great. You know, let me meet your parent. Hmm. And so instead of being a reasonable parent, contacting Damien's mom, Pam, and be like, hey, how can we chaperone our children and provide a healthy and safe environment for them to, you know, know one another and things like that? You know, how can we work together on this? He decided that he would try to destroy Damien and even destroy his daughter if that's what it took. He would ground her in a it got to the point where not only was she not allowed to go to Damien's house, but Damien wasn't allowed to come over there. And once he found out that at school that they were still able to see each other between classes and that Damien was carrying her books for her to class, he contacted the principal and made sure the principal had communications with the uh, school teachers to where if they saw Damien and Deanna together, they would physically split them apart like get in between them and like no y'all can't be around each other or you're going to detention so damien he's going to detention Hmm. and so damien and deanna being you know two teenagers in love and, and and seemingly the whole world against them being together the only solution they could come up with was to run away and so after school instead of going home they decided to go to california to make their dreams come true. And so they invited me to go. The story of Jason's youth sounds like a Mark Twain novel, a story of good-hearted boys up against a world ready to paint their play as mischief, with the kind of wandering plot where one misadventure follows another, twisting like a creek through the countryside. It's not the kind of story where you expect to find the mutilated bodies of children or accusations of satanic rape and murder. It never is.
we could tell you all the great reasons you should support Labyrinths on Patreon, including ad-free episodes and exclusive patron-only content. But why not hear it direct from a listener? Hi, my name is Allie, and I joined Labyrinth's Patreon because there's nowhere else that you can explore the ebbs and the flows of humanity with the kind of truth and grace that you can get with Labyrinth's. There really isn't anywhere else you can get that. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson. While Damien and his girlfriend Deanna were fighting to stay together in spite of her father's biases, Jason was dealing with his own emotional upheaval when his birth father came back into his life. Yeah, my mother just divorced when I was four, and then after I was five, my stepfather, you know, came in the picture. But somewhere along the way, there was this unwritten rule where there is no real dad. You know, you call your stepdad dad, and that's your dad, even though he doesn't have the same last name. And even though I have very strong memories of living with my father, and I, I see him in these memories, I know he's there. You know, the guy that I remember when I have these vivid memories, I'm sitting on this floor in this kitchen, and I'm leaning. I know it's against my mom's legs, but I've got this giant bowl of cake batter, right? <laughs> it's not full, but it's like sure. I got it everywhere. And in front of me, I can see sitting at the kitchen table, this man with this big old beard and he's holding this little baby. And I know that's my dad. Hmm. And that's all there is to that memory. But I see him, you know. And then there's another memory where I'm sitting at a coffee table in front of the TV and there's this tomato cut really weird looking with this gunk in it. Right. And there's another one next to it. And there's that same man taking a bite saying, eat it. It's good. See? Mm-hmm. And it was tuna uh, salad that my mom had made, putting the stuff, the tomato with it. I was like, I'm not eating that. And he was like, oh, it's good. You know, I remember that. You know, that's a memory I have. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, I can't lose it. I don't remember anything before or after it, but I remember that. One day, you know, just out the blue, I I was coming home from the store and uh, there was this uh, vehicle in, in the drive that was unrecognizable. I'd never seen before. And so I walked in and there in the living room was my dad. When I saw him, I knew that's who he was. I knew that was my father, even though we've not spoken about him at that point, you know, over a decade. Um, I've not seen a photo of him. You know, I've been calling another man my dad as long as I can remember at that point, you know, since I was five years old. And so at that point, my mom's like, oh, I'm out of cigarettes. And she goes, Larry, would you uh, take me to the store? And I'm like, I'm going to ride with y'all to the store. Even though I just got back to the store, right? And so I get in the back and we go to the store and my mom gets out and goes in and he turns around and goes, what, you know who I am? I say, yeah, you're my dad. I see this look, you know, like I knew he wouldn't forget me in his face, you know, and he just kind of nod. And my mom comes back into the uh, vehicle and, and he tells her, he's like, he knows who I am. And she immediately goes into hysterics and starts slapping him and telling him, you promise you wouldn't tell him, you know, and. And then he's like, I didn't tell him. And I'm like, Mom, I remember him. I know it's mad at you. She goes, Don't you? You can't f and say that. Don't, don't f and lie to me. You don't remember. You can't remember. I'm like I do remember, you know. And so, my dad would invite me and my brother, you know, to come visit, you know, for Christmas and get to know his side of the family and to meet his parents, those other grandparents that I don't remember, you know, that I don't know, and to meet his brothers me, his sister and their kids and everything. And so my brother and I, we go out to Sheridan, Arkansas, in in the middle of Arkansas, south of Little Rock. And uh, we're no longer on the edge of Arkansas. We're going way out in the middle of Arkansas now. And I meet all these people. I meet my grandparents. I meet my uncles and aunts and stuff. And it's Christmas time. I meet my cousin there. It's wonderful and it's great. And, And there's just so much love and warmth. And so when I go home and on the way home, my dad, he's like, hey, you're a teenager now. What would you say? about coming and living with me until you graduate high school, we'll get you a job at, at the store, you know, get you a vehicle, you know, and go to school out here and everything, you know, talk to your mom about it. And so when I got home, you know, and it's still a Christmas holiday, you know, and I talked to my mom about it, her reaction was, oh, you don't love me. You, you hate me. And she has a nervous breakdown and she would uh, attempt suicide and would slit her wrists or, or you know, her neck, yeah. you know, her elbows and stuff. And so I, I would I would find her and call 911 and stuff. And so when Damien asked me to run away with him and Deanna, I couldn't because I, I can't imagine what my mom 
how she would react, you know? And so I couldn't go with them and I couldn't give him any advice that would help him stay there still and, and be with Deanna too. Mm-hmm. And so he would run away and, and, and they would, of course, you know, get caught and he would go to get locked up. And I would learn later in a mental institution, he would go to kids prison where they tried to send me, which is, you know, juvenile hall and everything and 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 he went through hell he already you know suffers mental trauma and and he has to be medicated and has to be counseled and this has to be done with care and so now he's in a situation where he's ripped away from the person he loves and he's feeling the injustice of that and he's put in a place and where he's deprived of his medication and where he's basically you know tortured and the people there who are supposed to be counseling him aren't counseling him they're antagonizing him you know and patronizing him and, and just making things worse for him and not giving him the medication and so and they would use that you know record later you know when we would go on trial for a crime we didn't commit to to try to give him the death penalty and mm-hmm. succeed in doing that you know? and yeah. so all that stems from the prejudice of west memphis you know you asked what was growing up in west memphis and marion like and that's what it was like The prejudices of West Memphis were already strong enough to keep two young people in love apart, but they would only get more vicious after the bodies of three eight-year-old boys, Stephen Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore, were found mutilated in a creek bed. The murders happened on May the 5th. I found out about them on Thursday, May the 6th. They You know, of course, I learned about it at school, you know, on the news, because each of the classrooms had a TV in the room, you know, for like programming or for news events. And, you know, I was in Coach Baca's class and teacher came to the door and was like, hey, you need to go turn news on. And that's when they were showing, you know, that boys had just been found and and everything. So Hmm. it was pretty traumatic and everything. And at that point, my mom, you know, made us, you know, me and my little brothers, you know, stay at home until they find who did these murders they put out you know on the news that after that point uh, do you know anything about you know what was done this crime or anything there's there's a reward not long after the murders rumors started to circulate about damien damien's probation officer he had one at this point from running away with deanna and i mentioned how damien was antagonized and, and not treated with care when he was arrested and denied medication and, and because of that he didn't react well to them his and he didn't react well to being on probation either. He was like, you know, I'm being treated unjustly. I'm being treated wrong. So F this probation officer, F that guy. I don't want to be talked to every week. I don't want to go to this guy's, you know, office every week and talk to him and have him question all of my choices all the time. So he had a, a combative, antagonistic attitude. And so that bled over into his probation officer he had the same attitude back i didn't have that type of experience with my probation officer even though i had to talk to him all the time i didn't blame him for it you know he's just doing his job and you know yes i have to answer a million questions but if my mom asked me a million questions i gotta answer those too so it's just part of being a kid and then being part of being wrongfully convicted you know Mm -hmm. and and a sense you gotta follow the rules and, and do what they tell you and so because of that, his probation officer had a deep hatred towards him mm. and a deep hatred towards everything about it. And so he he was the one that said Damien must have done this. And so he started this whole rumor mill that Damien is part of a satanic cult and that the only person who could have committed this crime was a satanic cult. And so he would go around the entire city of West Memphis and around the entire city of Marion showing people photos of Damien and saying, have you seen this cult leader around in your neighborhood? Have you heard of a satanic cult being out here? Did you know that we think that those boys were murdered by a satanic cult? And he just kept saying this and kept asking people this. And so people would say, hey, man, you would believe what the police just asked me Hmm. as they talked to one another. And so that created the whole rumor of Satanism being the cause of the murders. So that's how we were scapegoated. 
What did you think when the rumor mill got around to you that these murders were a result of Satanism? And did you immediately hear Damien's name associated with it? And if so, what did you think? Well, when when I heard it, it was actually from the police and they were questioning me. Mm. Right. And, and and it was in front of my house. And they were like, do you think there's a cult in there? Do you think these crimes could have been a cult related? And at the time, Damien thought he was a religious knowledge guru. He loved to read about religion and all types of religions. So he thought this could be a career opportunity for me to advise the police because he didn't know who committed the crime, but the police were telling him that it was satanic. So he offered any offer information that he knew about Satanism and cultism and things like that, not realizing that they were targeting him to be the scapegoat and anybody around him. Mm. And the way that the police operate is they will target people around you and, and, and lie to them and, and lie to you to the point and tell you that they have all the evidence in the world against you in, in order to make you lie against the person they want to you know, make fall for the crime. Yeah. So that's actually really interesting that the police were coming around to people's houses, coming around to the trailer parks, asking people about cults and Satanism. And then they call Damien in and Damien, who's doing a bunch of reading about different like religious practices, is like, oh, I can tell you about cults. And then they like turn that into, see, yeah. he's a cult leader. Had you ever heard of the Satanic Panic before all of this had happened? I know you were so young. No, and and I didn't watch the news or, and things like that. The only things that were forced upon me by school, but I was a kid, you know, and then had my own problems, you know, to face and my own life to live, you know, and I wasn't as worldwise as, you grow, as I grew up to be now. Yeah. No, I had not heard of the satanic panic at that point, mm -hmm. no. I had been wrongfully convicted in a sense at the age of 11. Even, and even though at that point I was still kind of kind of blame myself because I'm like, you know, I was there playing high and go seek. So in essence, you know, I felt guilt for it, even though I didn't really felt like I deserved the punishment because there wasn't any, no trespassing sign. And I didn't break anything and I never saw anybody break anything mm -hmm. in there either. The police investigation linked Damien to Jesse Miss Kelly through deeply dubious information by a neighbor who claimed the three had gone to a witches' meeting together, a statement she later said she'd made up in part because of police pressure. Jesse, who had a reported IQ of 72, was brought in for questioning, and after 12 hours of interrogation, only 46 minutes of which were recorded, and all without a parent or lawyer, Jesse was coerced into a false confession, which implicated Damien and Jason. Though his supposed confession was riddled with inconsistencies, and though he soon recanted, the police arrested all three teenagers for the murders. The night I was arrested and when I was questioned, you know, by police detectives, they weren't receptive to the truth. They had a, a fictitious story they wanted to stick to, and their work was to break my will to accept their story. That's the only thing that they wanted to do. They didn't want the truth, and no matter how many times I told them the truth you know, about where I was at the day of the murders, what my life was like, who I was, and things, they were absolutely refused it. And so years later, I would hear you know, testimony from several of my neighbors, you know, what life was like after I was arrested in the torture they were put under by the police department by the media and the suspicion they lived under you know they would be just kids pulled out of their homes and questioned and not questioned in a way to where the questioners are you know being accepting of answers the questions are put in an accusatory tones like were you a member of the cult too yeah you might want to make a deal now or you could suffer the same fate Exactly. Just like with Damien, when we were being questioned outside my house, you know, we don't know who committed the crime or anything about it. We just only know what we're being told as well. And what you're being told is stuff that people imagine because they don't have the facts. These are just the worst case scenarios that they can imagine. And in the absence of fact, their imaginations are given the weight of fact. And that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. and, and in a sense, you know, it's like, trying to speak to my mother when she isn't well, when she's suffering from a mental breakdown. It's like trying to reason with the unreasonable. You're doing it from a position 
that's powerless as a mm. child and then as a defendant, as a kid being accused of a crime, you have no position to argue with anybody, no no way to make them see the facts for what they are. You know, you can only put them out there and hope they'll take them and, and look at them, but they mm. don't. I still felt like even though I'd been arrested for a crime I didn't commit, even then I still had hope that since we were actually going to trial that, you know, we would be found not guilty. The state would pursue facts over fiction, but I should have realized, you know, that what was shown to me the night of my arrest, the way they were questioning me and the way they refused the truth, that that's how the whole trial would be. And that's how everything leading up to the trial would be. Instead of everything being based on fact, it would be based on lies. Anna Vasquez of the San Antonio Four had the very same naive belief. So did I despite facing that very same attitude during questioning, a refusal by authorities to accept the simple and true answers I gave them. There's no way anyone will believe this ludicrous story. Everything will get cleared up at trial. Again and again, I hear that from my friends who've been wrongly convicted. If your only experience of the criminal legal process is television, You think the courtroom is like a laboratory where all the accusation and suspicion gets boiled down to truth beyond a reasonable doubt. But the courtroom isn't a laboratory. It's a battleground of storytelling, where the most compelling story, and not necessarily the most truthful, wins. Jesse Miss Kelly was tried separately from the other two and was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Jason and Damien went to trial together. From the start, the biases of West Memphis were on full display. Without knowledge, you have a back, and it's, just, it's, it's an empty space, and you just seek knowledge, right? You want to fill it with the answer to the questions you have. And the media serves that purpose for the public, you know, but the media has that same quest for knowledge, you know, what are the facts? And a lot of defense attorneys are trained to tell their clients do not speak to the media, right? And so in this vacuum, this need for knowledge, they're wanting this information and the only people that will give them information is the state. And so the state, just like the police, that works for the state, the prosecutors, they can lie to you during the course of an investigation. They can lie to the media about you during the course of an investigation. They don't have to give the facts. And when the police do this and the media run with it and and put it on TV and the radio and in print for their viewers, we all absorb this information thinking it must be true. It must be factual. It must be accurate. We never question. You know, we're not trained to question it. We're trained to believe that the police and the state are there to protect us and to serve us and to serve the interests of justice and to find the truth. We're never told that the Supreme Court gives them permission to lie to any of us about a crime. They will lie about us, and they can do so with impunity and immunity and no punishment whatsoever. And because of that, you know, mm-hmm. the deck is stacked against innocent people who find themselves under mm-hmm. the crosshair of the justice system. My attorney, he pulled me to the side and whispered in my ear, and he says, no, remember the judge's orders. No matter what you hear, no matter what you say, you cannot react to it. You are to remain stoic and, and quiet. You will get your chance to address that. And so here's come Michael Carson and tells these lies that, that I had told him in the county jail that I had done these crimes when I never told him. I'd never heard of Michael Carson until he was walking in the courtroom. Michael Carson was another teenager who was in the county jail at the same time as Jason. He testified at trial that Jason had confessed to him that he had taken part in the murders. False testimony from jailhouse informants, by the way, is one of the leading causes of wrongful convictions. And we weren't even allowed to question why he was in the county jail. We weren't allowed to question him because he wasn't the one on trial. He was protected by the state. And Mm -hmm. I, the innocent person, Damien, the innocent person, Jesse, the innocent person, were not protected. We were victimized over and over again. Even the whole satanic 
thing, you know, what was live. They mentioned he has 12 black t-shirts in his closet is what Fogelman said. Yes, I had 12 black t-shirts, but I also had other colored t-shirts and button up shirts <laughs> and different things. I had a gray journey t-shirt uh, of the escape album with the red half sleeves. I had a white Motley Crue Dr. Feelgood t-shirt. I had a white Ozzy Osbourne t-shirt. I had all different types of colored t-shirts, you know, besides black, but he only said black to prejudice. It wasn't a whole truth because he wasn't interested in presenting the truth to the jury, only half truths and lies in order to enable them to convict us, not on fact, but on their prejudices. Of course, it wouldn't matter if all Jason ever wore was black clothing. His taste in clothes, like his love for heavy metal music, was completely irrelevant to the question of whether or not he committed murder. But when your character is assassinated in the courtroom and in the media, you're forced to waste time justifying small details like these about your life and personality, anything that makes you different from the people around you. And for the prosecution, bringing up these details seemed to work. The jury in Jason and Damien's trial wasn't inclined to be sympathetic to them. They weren't a mm -hmm. juror of our peers, as they say. First of all, since this was a death penalty case, the jurors had to be what's called death penalty qualified. And so anybody who's my peer would not be allowed to be a jury. Anybody who doesn't be, believe in the death penalty would not be allowed to be a juror in my case. And the people hmm. who are skeptical of the death penalty are usually the people who understand that the police can lie to a person in an investigation. The people who believe in the death penalty are usually people who believe that the police are not empowered to lie, who will be honest. And so therefore, in a trial, when you have a fact being contested by two different people, one is a police officer, a death penalty qualified juror is going to believe the police officer and not you. And so that's prejudicial. Mm -hmm. And so we never had a chance. And then by public defenders, Paul Ford and Robin Wiley, I don't know if they ever actually believed in my innocence or believed that Damien was innocent because they kept on, you know, well, what about this? You know, when they would bring up the record, you know, Damien's, you know, mental health record and things like that, his anguish during that, as if that was evidence of guilt for the crime and as if that was evidence of cultism and that that was evidence of me being involved with it, you know, and so it, it was very... Mm -hmm frustrating to give the truth truthful answers of questions but still see those answers being received not with belief but with skepticism my public defender you know every day i would ask him you know when do i get to testify you know when do my witnesses get to testify and he was like you know not today you know and he would just blow me off you know but at that point i'm being pulled away by the guards back to the jail out of the courtroom so i'm not able to communicate really with him and when i question him you know i'm just a kid at that point i'm not i've never really been allowed to question adults i've never been allowed to exert my will against an adult you know and so when mm -hmm. adult puts her foot down and is like that's the last word you have to obey it and so it's a very disadvantaged position to be in when you're a kid and an innocent kid and the people who are supposed to be protecting you are there it was my whole trial was ended and i was never given an opportunity to testify my witnesses were never given an opportunity to testify jason was sentenced to life in prison while damien was sentenced to death but meanwhile one of the most important developments in the case of the west memphis three was underway during the trial, filmmakers Joe Berlinger and Bruce Sanofsky had begun filming a documentary about the case. That movie was called Paradise Lost. They went down to Arkansas thinking they were making a film about three depraved teens who'd committed horrible murders. But in the course of filming the trials, they came to the conclusion that they were documenting a tremendous miscarriage of justice. There's this woman in, in Los Angeles, Kathy Bakken, and she has the coolest job in the world. She gets movies before everybody and gets to watch them. That's her job, right? And then she, <laughs> right? Like, you know how you're waiting on a movie to come out? You see an advertisement, and you're like, oh, in two weeks it's in theaters and you got to wait. She's already seen it. 
a long time ago because she gets the movies and she makes the cool uh, poster art. She makes the movie art, you know, that you see at the movie theaters that you see, you know, on the display, you know, advertising. And so she gets Paradise Lost as part of her job, you know, and she watches all types of movies. Even ones that she doesn't like, you know, it's part of her job, but you know, she gets like watch one she does too. And so when she watches it, she's like, Oh my God, you know, she's horrified, you know, that we were railroaded in such a way. So she shows the movie to all of her friends, you know, to Burke Sauls, to Grove Pashley, to Lisa Fancher, and they write Damien, they write Jesse, and they write me. They're like, Oh my God, you know, and so we write them back. They're like, hey, can we come visit you? I'm like, yes, please. And so they come to Arkansas and they go to uh, Dan Stidham's office. And he was Jesse Miss Kelly's trial attorney. And they're in there talking to him about the case, you know, before visiting us. And they're like, what's being done legally? And he tells them, he says, listen, the truth is this. If the people in this room right here, right now, don't do something, no one will. That small group of people would go on to make the website WM3.org, which became an essential source of information about the case. When the documentaries came out, people all over the world saw, you know, what we went through and started writing us and, 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 and getting on the message boards and started calling, you know, for justice and help and everything. And that's when things started to change. That's when they started raising money to hire attorneys to represent us post-conviction, um, started paying for DNA testing to get done, uh, and, or to hire attorneys first to just argue that we were be allowed to get the DNA testing because the state fought us every step of the way to hire investigators to do investigations. And so that's when people started supporting us. And, you know, and, and, and that was, the theme was usually the same. Hey, I was just like you as a kid. You know, I listened to heavy metal music, rock t-shirt, incredible mullet, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. That's when the support started, and that's what gave us hope. Support for the West Memphis Three grew exponentially, with celebrities like Eddie Vedder, Johnny Depp, and the Dixie Chicks joining the cause. Finally, in 2010, the Arkansas Supreme Court ordered a new evidentiary hearing for the West Memphis Three. Their attorneys were preparing for a new trial. If they won, the state would potentially have to pay the three of them millions for their wrongful convictions. But before they went to trial, Jason's attorney came to him with another option. It was uh, a Wednesday, August the 10th, and uh, they said, Bowen, go back out into the hallway. You know, just as I was walking in, uh, they need you at the control center. You have an attorney visit. And uh, all the times I've had an attorney visit, I know well in advance. So this one, was an unannounced one, which told me something was up, even though I knew at this point we had an evidentiary hearing set for December the 22nd in front of Judge Lacer. There's things going on in the case, investigations being going on, happening and things like that. A lot of uh, communications behind the scenes, state attorneys and our attorneys trying to get things agreed upon as far as testing and stuff like that, rather than fighting, you know, in front of the court and litigating and everything. And so, I go and get strip searched and all that stuff, you know, before going up front to the uh, ship briefing room where they would have the uh, attorney visit. And uh, as soon as I walked in, there's Blake, you know, my, my Arkansas counsel. He's like, Jason, uh, what would you say if I told you you could go home tomorrow? I said, I hear a big butt in there. <laughs> you know, he's like, yes. Uh, let me tell you about the Alfred play. I was like, oh, I know about the Alfred plea was like, I have to explain it, you know, as part of my, my requirements as your attorney, I have to legally explain every offer of the, the state and everything. And so he had everything printed out and we walked through it and everything. In an Alfred plea, defendants can plead guilty while still claiming to be innocent. It allows them to walk free, but it also allows the state to maintain its conviction record without having to admit fault for a wrongful conviction. Frankly, and I don't say this lightly, it's fucked up. The state only offers an Alfred plea when they know they've convicted an innocent person. Why else would they be fine with that person walking free from a life sentence? And if the innocent person takes the bargain, and it's hard to resist freedom after decades in prison for a crime you didn't commit, then prosecutors will never face accountability for their actions, 
and the state won't have to pay compensation for wrongful imprisonment. And I was like, no way in the world will I sign that. Never, ever. And, uh, and, and he gave me a hug. He's like, I'm proud of you. You know, I was hoping that would be your response, you know, because we had everything on our side. You know, we, we finally had DNA testing happening, even though the state didn't agree to test everything we wanted. They did agree to test some things. And those things showed that we were not who was giving that DNA, who was there to crime and stuff, who committed the crime. And so, I, you know, I was very uh, hopeful for, for the upcoming evidentiary hearing. I was hopeful for a trial. I had a very dear friend at the time. Uh, uh, I called her that night and everything. And, uh, of course, she had been talking to Damien's wife, Lori, and everything. Of course, everything was a buzz and, and stuff because case. And I was like, hey, you know, they offered me an Alfred plea today. We'll, we'll talk about it, you know, Saturday when you come visit because she was going to come visit me that Saturday. And uh, she was like, awesome. I'm glad you said no, you know. Of course, she didn't know anything about Alfred plea. She just knew plea, you know. She, she knew I was looking forward to the trial and everything and finally proving our innocence and you know, getting our, the honor of our names back and, and going home. And so this was like mental torture. Saturday happens, you know, you have a different set of clothes that you wear for visits. They don't want people to see you in your normal rags, right? And so um, I get my visitation, which is against the rules for you to put on your visitation clothes if you don't have a visit scheduled. And you have to get them scheduled ahead of time, like whoever wants some visits. So you have to be on your visitors list. They have to call and make an appointment to visit you. And then there has to be a, you know, an opening for that visitation day, you know, because it's of limited spaces and stuff. And so I had one scheduled. And so visitation is from noon to four, but they have a one o'clock count term, right? And when they do count, they lock the prison down about 20 minutes or so before count time to start getting ready for the count time. So if you have a visit, you always want your visitor to get there early enough to where you can get called out and they can get processed and the guards can call you out of the barracks or from work or wherever you're at. And you can get there in time before that one o'clock count starts. In essence, you want to be called around 12, 12, 15 or 1230, because after 1230, you might not be called until after count is cleared. And because visitation is going on and because people aren't in their normal areas, they tend to mess up count a lot on visitation days. And so the count, instead of being 10 or 15 minutes and then they unlock the place down, might be 30, 45, an hour, two hours, three hours. And sometimes for the lucky people who got out on visitation, they might say emergency count, everybody head back to the barracks you know, for a recount, you know, and so that's what you definitely don't want because then they won't restart visitation back up, you know, and you just missed your visit. And so I'm sitting there right at, in, in the day room. I got my visitation clothes. I'm looking at the television. I'm in front of the door. I'm by the call box waiting on my name because, you know, I got a visit coming up, you know, and so 12 o'clock rolls around, you know, the earliest possible time they'll call. They start calling people, you know, names and stuff. People start going to visits, not me. And then at 1230 rolls around, I'm sitting there looking at the clock. And so, you know, you're thinking I've, at this point, I've done 18 years. What, what's time, you right? What's time, right? But it's in those minutes. Those are the minutes that drag on longer than any other minute in the world, right? Is when you're waiting on something good and you're looking at the clock, right? And so sure enough, they holler in the intercom, everybody catch your at count time. Oh man, I didn't beat the count. I hope, you know, they do it quick and get it done quickly, you know? And so everybody catches your rack, they do count time. I'm sitting on my rack, you know? And so I go back up there after you count, I'm waiting at the day room. And so about one o'clock, they clear the count and start calling visitors again. If they don't call me. I'm like, oh, well, uh, she must be late, you know, which she's never late. And uh, so I'm sitting there and all of a sudden, about 2.30, getting close to 3 o'clock, I'm starting to imagine things now, right? Like, what if she had an accident, you know, on the way here? What if she got a flat tire, you know? What if they're giving her a problem at the gate because of something she's wearing, you know? And now they're in a verbal match up there or something because I could, you know, that stuff like that happens, you know? So any scenario without any fact 
my mind is racing. and I'm just imagining things right at that point in time. It's like, it's ticking, you know? And so finally they say, Baldwin, ah, yes, I'm getting my visit. They say, go to the chaplain's office and they only call you to the chaplain's office for one thing. And that's when someone has died. And so there I am waiting on this visit, worrying now because of the visit. I haven't been called to the visit. And now I'm being called to the chaplains. Now my worst fears seem to be coming true, right? And so I can't run down the hallway. It's against the rules. And so I'm like, I'm, I'm in 12 barracks, right? I got to get all the way down past the control center, right? 12 barracks, there's a crash gate at every two barracks, right? I got to stop at this crash gate. And in every crash gate, there's other people. And I'm still wearing my visitation clothes. I haven't even changed out. I'm going down the hallway. You know, I can't run. And everybody that sees me, they're like, Paul, when you're going to visit, man, glad you got a visit, man. Have a good one. And every time someone says that, it's like a knife in my heart because that's where I should be going. But that's not where I'm going. You know, I'm going to the chaplain's office where I'm about to get the worst news in the world. And so every crash gate, everybody that stops me is well wishing me, you know, I'm glad to see me, but it's not what's happening. I'm, I'm going to something else. And so I get there and the chaplain hands me the phone. You know, I'm expecting something terrible. And I get the phone and it's Hoffley who I was supposed to get to visit. And I'm just like, at this point, I'm like crying. My, my heart is beating. I'm so relieved that she's not dead. And I'm like, what is going on? And she's like, I'm sorry I couldn't come visit you. I'm with Lori. She's been up all night with Damien. He cared that he's going to die. If, if if we don't get this alpha plea, he's scared that they're going to kill him, even though all this stuff. And at this point, I'm so relieved that she realized that the idea of anybody dying at this point, no matter what the possibility is, I can't take it. I can't take it. And so I call uh, a Blake immediately, you know, I'm like, tell him I'm going to take the alpha plea, you know, and so that, that's how that happened. If not for Damien facing the death penalty, Jason would have refused the Alfred plea on principle until he had a chance to prove his innocence in court and force the state to acknowledge fault. That deal with the devil saved Damien's life, but it meant that all three men, though released, were still formally convicted of murder. Despite the injustice of their legal situation, they've managed to build lives for themselves after prison. Jason co-founded an organization called Proclaim Justice that works to exonerate innocent people. And he still loves Metallica as much as he did as a teenager. The band became supporters of the West Memphis Three after learning about how their music was used against the boys in court. Well, after I got out, they invited me to San Francisco to their 30th year anniversary. They were in at the film where they had four nights of shows. And so after that, you know, Lars is like, dude, any show we have anywhere, you're welcome. If you can get there. <laughs> I just have to get there. It's not like he's going to fly me to all the shows. That would be too expensive and crazy. But if I can get there, I, I got a seat, you know, and I can bring friends. Uh, I took Daniel. We went to uh, see Metallica in El Paso. Daniel Villegas was the defendant at the center of a wrongful conviction case that proclaimed justice took on. Thanks to Jason and his organization, Daniel was acquitted after over two decades in prison. I went behind the scenes and met Lars and them, and, you know, and, and he got to hang out with Lars, you know, Daniel Villegas, and he's a Metallica fan, you know, and so to be able to share that with somebody and to know that this kid suffered what I went through, and now here he is kicking it and hanging out with Metallica, you know, and we're all just jamming out, and so that old work there too, you know, and so just to do that, that's fun. Jason is also friends with Anna Vazquez, our guest from last episode. Since I've been here in Texas and Austin, uh, she invited me down to her ranch and hang out with her and her wife, Denise, and some of their friends. And honestly, we didn't talk about, even then, talk about cases and things like that too much because we were uh, putting together, like, uh, Anna's wife, Denise, coupons. And then she had some friends mm -hmm. whose wives coupon. And so they have the storage shit full of stuff that they coupon. And so they would put them together in little packages, right? And so I don't coupon or shop. I don't. That's beyond me, but that's their superpower. But 
they would then hand the stuff off to me and another of her friends, and we would drive into uh, Austin and give out, you know, stuff to homeless people, you know, and things like that. And so we we would do this is pre COVID. We would do this, you know, a couple of times a month, you know, on the weekend and stuff. And so and then we would sit outside in her yard, you know, around the fire, you know, eating good food that you know Denise barbecued and stuff like that. I never forget the first time I went over there. Um, uh, Denise's mom was staying with them, and uh, before I walked in, they're like, "Hang on, can't go in yet." And uh, Anna yelled in the house. She goes, "Man in the house, man in the house!" <laughs> because Denise's mom was in there, and apparently they would say this. This was a phrase they brought from their time in prison for like when a, a male guard would walk into the barracks because they grew up in an open barracks of women. And so they had female guards and men guards, but when men guards would come into the barracks, they would, somebody would yell that to let people know you got a guy coming in here, you know? And so they carried that tradition home with them. And to warn their mom that they were bringing a guy in, they yelled this. So I just found that so, I don't know, endearing and just funny and just real. I'm curious to because you're such a like positive guy and and you're such a sweet guy. I mean, I just I know that because I've met you. <laughs> and I wonder if you struggle um, in the same way with me, where it's like on any given day, I feel like I'm doing good work. I've turned this horrible thing that happened to me into something that gives me purpose. But also, like there are days where. I just remember a horrible moment and it's crushing to me. And as much as you can make this a part of you in a positive way, are there are there things that you struggle to to sort of translate that way? Is there anything that just hurts when you think back on it? Oh, there's a lot that hurts, you know, a lot of it hurts. And just because, you know, I, I, I react to things in the most positive way possible. The whole world is like that. And not everybody's been able to turn the situation into a positive. It's like I didn't run away with Damien because I didn't want to cause harm to my family because I knew that my mom would not respond to that in a healthy way. Just like she didn't respond to my dad's request that I go live with him until I turn 18 in a healthy way. And so she didn't respond to me being in prison in a healthy way, you know, and she still had my two younger brothers to care for. And so those things like that that were beyond my control are the things that hurt the most. And even though while inside and in prison, I tried to be the best positive role model for them that I could. You know, I got my GED in there. I applied myself and worked above and beyond what was called for in the terms of my condemnation of to serve a lifetime of hard labor. I served every day in hard labor, but I went above and beyond. That. And because of that, I would win the respect of everybody in the administration would give and trust, you know, with great jobs that required more than hard labor from me, that required, you know, me to apply myself in jobs that was in a caring way to help heal people. I was able to help people get their education. I was able to counsel people. And all of this was to show my brothers, like, yes, we've gone through hell, but you know what? You can pick yourself up and do good with it. But they had a totally different attitude to me. They're Young teenagers growing up under the shadow of their older brother getting arrested. And so them are like, you know, my mom couldn't tell them anything at that point. Like, oh, Jason always did what you told him to do. You know, he always did right. Look what happened to him. So F the world, you know. And so to witness that, mm. to witness my brothers go through that and to live that lifestyle and make those life decisions causes a lot of pain to this day, you know. So, yeah, you know. You live with things that you can change and you live with the things you can't change. You do your best and hope yeah. for the best. Yeah. Yeah, that's real. I definitely feel that, too, because um, I'm also an older sibling and my younger sisters were definitely impacted by this and and have had their own struggles that they still deal with to this day. So that's a really difficult part. And it's not something that's your fault or my fault, but also it's, you can't take it back, right. you know, like you can't make it better for them. We've spent a long time talking. Do you have any final thoughts? All right. Yeah. You know, satanic panic, prejudice, those are all, you know, things that we must protect our hearts against, like racism. Those things are infectious, I believe, like paranoia, any type of negative mentality, a, a social construct. 
Um, they tend to, you know, spread you know, through people, you know, and things like that. Just protect your heart. We all must protect our hearts against prejudice, um, against fear of the other, against fear of the unknown, uh, and against just dislike of people's personal choices, you know, and lifestyles, you know. Just because someone has a different lifestyle or set of beliefs than yours doesn't mean it's wrong and doesn't mean that you're going to be forced into that lifestyle or beliefs. You know, it just means that they're free to exercise their liberties in the best way that they see fit. And I just ask that people respect that and not try to think that, mm -hmm. oh, that person's living that way. I'm going to be forced to live that way. No, just let people live mm -hmm. their lives freely. And then when it comes to crimes and things like that, it, it, it's a very difficult paradigm shift to look at the news and when they say suspect to not think, oh, well, that's the person who committed that crime. For the uh, justice system to work, there must be what's called, you know, the uh, uh, benefit of the doubt, you know, the preponderance of the evidence. You know? So to deny that denies an integral ingredient for justice's work. It's like trying to baked bread without yeast is good it's not going to rise it's just going to be a cracker it's going to be unleavened it's not going to be bread you're not going to get what you're trying to get without that integral ingredient without the presumption of innocence and so if we start out the gate on every single accusation denying the presumption of innocence just assuming that that person was guilty assuming that the right person was being charged with the crime then we've already failed and so we we must mm -hmm protect ourselves against that and the only way to do that is to educate ourselves and as many people as we can about that if you want to support jason's work on behalf of the wrongly convicted you can donate to proclaim justice at proclaimjustice.org it's an uphill battle to overturn a wrongful conviction one that jason is still fighting himself the west memphis three are still not fully exonerated right now Damien Eccles is asking the Arkansas Supreme Court to allow new DNA testing of the evidence in their case. Stay tuned for our next episode, where we'll chat with Joe Berlinger, co-director of the West Memphis Three documentary, Paradise Lost. In the meantime, get lost with us. Find us on Twitter, at Amanda Knox. At Man Under Bridge. Telling stories like this can be challenging, but we're always refueled by thoughtful comments and reviews. So please, if you find Labyrinths valuable, leave us a five-star review, spread the word, and check out our other work at knoxrobinson.com. This episode was written and produced by us and Sophia Gates, with editing and sound design by Josh Thane, and theme music by Josh Budo Karp. Hello, listener. This episode of Labyrinths could be ad-free, but that requires exclusive access. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to become a monthly Patreon subscriber, which will grant you access to top-secret patron-only content. This podcast will self-destruct without your support. Was that too cheesy? Who doesn't like cheese? Visit patreon.com slash Robinson.